Hello, this is Neil Hansen. I'm one of the radiologists at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, and I'm giving a lecture on ultrasound imaging, particularly the physics of Doppler imaging. Um, so I uh, use a fair amount of material taken free source off of the internet. I am not using this for publication or any other purposes to make money. This is just used for free source educational purposes. Here is a website uh, that you can go. I've created a quiz to go along with the educational materials on Pull Everywhere. You can go ahead and uh, take the questions that I ask during the lecture along with uh, others. I use the survey results to improve my lectures. Also for my residents, please log in with your name and I use this as an attendance check to make sure that you did uh, this physics module. References for this short talk, uh, the RSNA module, Interaction of Ultrasound Tissue and Doppler. Uh, it's also covered in the Huda Review Book, Chapter 10, and the Larger Comprehensive Medical Physics Imaging Text of Pushburg, Chapter Number 14. Basics of Doppler, we're going to cover that along with pulsed, color, and power Doppler, as well as how to optimize Doppler imaging when you're doing it. Ah, every single time I forget to reset the poll questions. Obviously, you know what the answer is. Jeez. So the correct answer was a change in frequency. So the Doppler ultrasound measures the change in frequency. Correct answer is C. All right, Doppler ultrasound. The Doppler effect is that changes in frequency of sound result from a moving sound source. So if you think of an ambulance and the approaching ambulance, and if you think of the uh, kind of the cadence or the frequency of the sound going up and down, it will change as it comes towards you, getting closer together in terms of the crest of the sound intensity, and it will get longer apart with an apparent increase in the wavelength as the ambulance recedes. As you move towards a higher transducer, the frequency gets higher. As you move away, the frequency gets lower. The math, what's the math in this? Well, the shift in the frequency is proportional to the cosine of theta, where that is the angle between the ultrasound beam and the moving object, which is known as the Doppler angle. Um, so here's a YouTube clip that's an excellent uh, thing. If you just Google Doppler ultrasound physics uh, or under YouTube search for it, uh, it's really useful. I had to advise reading it uh, or watching it. It really uh, explains the Doppler shift to better advantage than I can. Uh, so I'd urge you to go and look at that. Doppler ultrasound. So frequency uh, times the velocity over the, uh, the speed of sound. So the maximum frequency shift is the angle in zero degrees, which is not practical for vessels, right? You can't get to zero degrees. You'd have to have an interluminal transducer, which is just not really feasible. Uh, so no Doppler shift is seen if the motion is exactly perpendicular to the sound beam or transducer. So you can't use 90 degrees either, because if you're at 90 degrees, you won't see a shift. Uh, so that's like, I don't know if this ever really happens in real life, but theoretically you could think there was no flow in like a carotid artery if you were imaging at exactly 90 degrees. The optimal uh, angle is therefore, uh, you know, someone closer to zero degrees, uh, but certainly less than 90. The magnitude of the Doppler shift is proportional to the frequency. Uh, and the Doppler shift is just the frequency uh, times the reflector velocity divided by the speed of sound in that given material. So if you look at this, uh, you know, you have a direction of travel, uh, you have a maximum Doppler shift as it's coming towards you, you have no Doppler shift if you're at 90 degrees to that moving car, you have a negative Doppler shift if you're behind the car and it's going away from you, and you have a Doppler shift max uh, equals the maximum times the cosine of this angle theta. Um, and when it's 90, or when it's zero degrees, that cosine uh, creates the maximum Doppler shift. And it's gonna progressively decrease as you increase the angle 
uh, of incidents. So here's that mathematically programmed out for those of you that are mathematically inclined. Obviously, like we said, unless you have an endoluminal transducer, you can't get that angle of incidence to zero, and it's not going to give you any flow uh, quantitative information if it's perpendicular. So this angle is going to be something, for example, like 60 degrees. You get a higher Doppler frequency if your velocity is increased, if the beam is more aligned to flow direction, and if there's a higher frequency used to measure. Doppler and blood flow. So ultrasound is used to evaluate flow based off of sound backscatter from the blood cells that are moving within the blood vessel. It gives rise to very weak signals. You can get a uh, color Doppler as well as a um, spectral Doppler with spectral Doppler is just this waveform here. Pulse wave Doppler. So uh, this provides depth information as only the echoes from a region of interest are used to make the Doppler signal. So like pulse wave Doppler or spectral here, you put the transducer, um, uh, you just use a cursor on the ultrasound machine and you put your sampling area here within the vessel that you're looking at and you know, you know, below the baseline, that means the flow is going away from that area. Above the baseline means it's going toward that area and towards the transducer. In general, red is a color assigned to towards the transducer. Green is away from the transducer. Very low frequencies are eliminated and filtered out because they're just noise, and multiple signals are usually obtained and averaged together to create something that looks sensical. Doppler shift is least likely to depend on which of the following. The correct answer is depth. Depth really doesn't matter that much so long as you can see it. Duplex scanning. So this combines a real-time imaging study like B-mode images with the Doppler detection of the region of interest. Doppler angle is able to be calculated by the transducer, so it's not like you manually have to calculate that angle. The computer does it for you. And then you get an image which looks like this of the carotid artery, for example. Pulse length. So the longer pulse length used in pulse Doppler uh, improve accuracy of the frequency shift. But it reduces axial resolution, so it's always a trade-off. You can use a longer pulse length to improve your accuracy, but then you're not going to be able to have very good resolution on your images. What is the best way to reduce this artifact? It's called uh, increasing the PRF. I realized I didn't show you a picture of the artifact. I was thinking internally that maybe I would just pretend like I didn't botch that, but I just botched it, I'm sorry. So aliasing, so uh, aliasing is illustrated here on this picture. Uh, so if the velocity is very high, higher than the sampling frequency, then the transducer becomes confused as to which direction the flow is going. Uh, and that results in a mixing of colors. So frequently, instead of red or blue, you'll get something that's yellow or green, and it's a sign of very high velocity. To prevent this, you have to increase your pulse repetition frequency to two times the highest Doppler frequency shift. So you have to increase the um, uh, the pulse, uh, the, uh, the frequency of how often you're listening or how often you're sampling, for that frequency shift to two times that highest Doppler frequency shift. So for example, a one kilohertz Doppler shift really needs a pulse repetition frequency of at least two kilohertz. Short term recall. Uh, what's the minimum PRF required to accurately measure a 1 kilohertz Doppler shift? Well, you should have all gotten that. The correct answer is to double the uh, maximum Doppler frequency shift. Spectral Doppler. So this simply displays frequency uh, shift as a function of time from a pulse Doppler duplex region of interest. Um, 
Again, like if flow is going towards the transducer, it's above the baseline. Flow away from the transducer is below the baseline. The horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is the frequency shift. And the intensity of a frequency shift can be assigned a given brightness, so you can get brightness information as well. Velocity is above the axis towards the transducer, below the axis, horizontal axis, away from the transducer. Here's probably the most common thing that you'll see when looking at like a carotid ultrasound or a vascular ultrasound. You'll see a uh, color Doppler image with the spectral analysis being done in the center of the vessel and then a spectral waveform tracing below it. Spectral analysis. So spectral displays give information on flow characteristics. Uh, they're like pulsatility. Usually blood flow is what we call laminar, uh, where it's slightly slower along the peripheral edges, uh, like you can see here, slightly slower flow because there's friction with the vessel wall versus a little bit faster in the center. That's called laminar flow. Turbulent flow is where it's kind of irregular and haphazard. Turbulent flow occurs where there's like atherosclerotic plaque, thrombus, stenosis. You'll get more turbulent appearing flow. Must have been a really hard one because I put two sound effects in there back to back. Did you notice that? Are you paying attention? All right, maximum Doppler frequency shift likely occurs when the angle is which of the following? Correct answer is zero. Short term recall, we've already covered that. All right, high resistance arterial flow. Due to the resistance of a vascular bed, there's a rapid velocity fall following systole. You may have reverse flow during early diastole also. This is a triphasic waveform. Typically, this is seen in arteries that supply the extremities, like the iliacs or the face, so branches of the external carotid. So high resistance. So high up peak looks like a very tall, sharp mountain or like the, the top of a spear. And then during early diastole, it goes down quite low, even sometimes below the baseline. This is related to like elastic recoil of the arteries where some of the flow goes backwards. And then it may come up and go above the baseline again before the next cycle. Low flow, so low resistance flow. Low resistance arterial flow uh, tends to supply beds that are more uh, emergent for immediate life. Uh, such as like getting blood to your brain or your kidneys. Lower resistance arterial flow show a more gradual downslope, so they look like more of a hill than a sharp high mountain peak. And uh, there's continued antegrade flow throughout all of diastole, so you don't have that dip below the baseline like you saw in the high resistance waveform. These tend to apply things like I said, carotid arteries, renal arteries, stuff that needs to get flow all of the time. Some vessels like the mesenteric vasculature or the hepatic artery can vary between low and high flow depending on when you recently ate. Um, so like you may have low flow waveforms after a meal, you may have higher flow uh, waveforms like if you're running a marathon. They're more versatile than like your carotids, which are essentially should always be low uh, resistance arterial flow uh, unless you're in a pathologic state. Oh, the internal carotid artery versus the external carotid artery. So this is a classic radiology question where they try and make you, uh, someone will quiz you on like, how do you tell the difference? Well, the external carotid artery has branches. So if you see a branch, it's the external. Internal carotid does not. The external carotid artery, you can see waves propagated through by a temporal tap versus the internal carotid, you're not. And the internal carotid should be a low resistance waveform, always up above the baseline, kind of, you know, a more gentle downslope versus the external carotid has a very high resistance waveform, sharp up, sharp down, all the way down to zero during diastole uh, with that little hump at the end, like you saw on the prior high resistance waveform. Veins, so veins typically show very low velocities and very low resistance. So you'll just see kind of like an undulating line without the high peaks of um, the arterial vasculature. 
Uh, I do want to say, though, that veins can oftentimes have phasicity, but not pulsatility. So pulsatile means it's going up and down and kind of that mountain or uh, high hill type of uh, morphology, but a uh, phasic, so they can kind of undulate up and down. Like you'll get phasic flow uh, and phasicity in the portal vein, even though usually you don't see pulsatility. All right, resistive index. So when we talk about the Doppler resistive index, it's just an equation. It's where you're looking at a spectral analysis like here. You're taking the maximum velocity, you're subtracting the minimum velocity, and then you're dividing it by the maximum velocity. This just compares maximum to minimum velocities within one given cardiac cycle. In general, to have accuracy uh, in the fidelity of this measurement, you wanna see about three spectral waveforms in a row to make sure that this number is accurate. And most commonly it's used in evaluating renal arteries and specifically it's used commonly in evaluating transplant vasculature. The hepatic artery is typically about 0.55 to 0.8. The renal artery is about 0.6 to 0.7. And then uh, when you're talking about pathology, at least related to a transplant, if you start to get a resistive index below 0.5, you have to worry about a stenosis. And what happens is that your maximum velocity here is going to go down, down. So if you look at this equation, the top part goes down because um, post-stenotic, the hepatic artery velocity is going to be less because it has to go through that stenosis. And relative to that, the diastolic velocity stays the same or may even be higher to try and preserve flow to the organ. And so as that um, those two numbers come together, your resistive index is going to be less than 0.5, and even in severe cases can be like 0.3 or 0.35 or something like that. All right, color Doppler. So 2D visualization of moving blood for color Doppler. The info is displayed on top of a B-mode ultrasound image, so you can make some sense of it, and you can measure velocity, determine direction, and magnitude. Red is towards the transducer, blue is away from the transducer, and anything in the green or yellow usually signifies aliasing and turbulent flow. Color Doppler, the spatial resolution tends to be lower than B-mode ultrasound, and usually it's employed along with the spectral analysis in a given region of interest. Power Doppler, similar information as color Doppler, but importantly different. And the difference is not in the energy used, but it's in how the information is acquired, processed, and displayed. So power Doppler relies on Doppler signal strength alone, so it ignores Doppler shift. It's not directional. So when you use power Doppler, it's just looking for any flow at all. It's irregardless of direction. So positive and negative values are used in a given region, and normally they would cancel each other out in a color Doppler setup, but they're summed and added together in power Doppler. And so all you can tell is like this kidney has flow to it. I don't know if what we're looking at is going away or from the kidney, but it definitely, there is flow there. How is this used? Well, if you're looking at, you know, you just want to see if there's any flow in an area, and probably the most common thing I can think of clinically is looking at a testicular ultrasound, especially in a younger child or infant, where all you want to know is, is there flow to that testicle? And uh, oftentimes it can be very challenging, especially in the younger uh, boys, to see testicular flow and exclude a torsion, um, especially in infants. And so power Doppler is commonly employed to see if there's any flow there at all. The signal doesn't vary with direction of flow. There's no aliasing artifact, and it's much, much more sensitive, especially for slow flow. It's considered the gold standard non-invasive imaging for flow detection. For example, like I said, testicular torsion. There's no directional information, no quantitative or velocity information, and it's very sensitive to flash artifacts. So here's an example of a flash artifact where if you're watching power Doppler in real time, the entire screen or the area that's being sampled for power Doppler just becomes all orange and it's kind of useless. So it's very prone to artifacts. That covers the Doppler section. Thank you for your participation and viewing my video.